construction, golf news, equipment, travel, interviews, course profiles, and more. Your weekly fix of all things golf is about to begin. It's the Flagstick Podcast with your hosts, Jeff Bonner and Scott McLeod. And yes, welcome to the Flagstick Podcast, sponsored this week again by Golf PEI. Golf Prince Edward Island is premier golf destination in Canada, boasting the most number of golf courses per capita in the country. With over 400 fairways closer than you can imagine, top-tier accommodations, and exquisite culinary experiences, it is the easiest golf vacation you will ever book. Book golf vacations and tee times at golfpei.ca. Now, before we get started, I want to make sure that you're following us across all the social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and soon-to-be TikTok. Um, subscribe to us on Spotify, <laughs> Audible, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts, and we really encourage you, really encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us, and click the notification bell, and make sure you never miss a single episode. We've already begun adding some new unique content, and we'll continue doing that throughout the golf season, as well as some giveaways like we did Ooh. near the end of last year. So Giveaways, I like yes, that. Yes, giveaways. You never know what we're going to give away. So you're never right. going to know what we're going to give away if you don't subscribe to us right. on YouTube. So and get at it. Yeah, I got to thank. Uh, we've had a, a real uptick in our subscribers lately. So got to thank the people for that. Uh, getting some good feedback, not only on the uh, the posts uh, with, uh, you know, the podcast, obviously, uh, but some of the shorts and stuff as well. So, we'll, you know, we'll keep uh, pounding content up there and, uh, you know, we respond to our, our community and whatever people are looking for, then we'll go from there. Well, it's kind of it's it's kind of where we're at now. I mean, you know, yeah, we're a digital since, since the since we're not you know printing golf magazines anymore, which you know believe believe me, um, I would absolutely love to be doing. And I've had people ask me if we're gonna if it's coming back, if we're gonna bring back the print. And the the short the short and simple answer is no. Um, it's been a, we've been away from it for long enough now that bringing it back, the cost efficiency of it just isn't yeah. there. And, uh, you know, we've moved on to to trying to create these new, it's more of a digital environment. And mm-hmm. this podcast is one of those components of the digital environment. You know, the website's doing extremely well. Tra- traffic is is crazy on the website these days, um, yeah. which is indicative to me <laughs> of the fact that the dang thing crashes from time to time. But <laughs> we, we've, we've resolved that majority of the issues with that. It's just, you know, it's it's load on our on the site. So yeah. if anybody wants to, it's just traffic. It's, yeah. you know, it's got which a lot great. of traffic. You know, it's and, nothing and, wrong with traffic. We just yeah, got to be prepared, got to be a little bit better prepared for it, which yeah. I think we are. So I think, you know, that's going to be fine because yeah. this podcast is, is our, is a new uh, you know, it's the second year of it. This is a new venture for us and uh, we're tweaking things and trying to make things better. And we really want to encourage people to get on that YouTube channel um, mm-hmm. so that we can do more there too. Right. Got Scott and I got some ideas, you know, we're yeah, lots of plans you know, for that. Lots yeah. of things for content. People should realize, you know, what, what we've done. And obviously we've had, you know, a website since 1996, you know, as our digital home base, but, you know, we've always been progressive as far as adding other streams and other ways of doing things. The whole thing here is to be as dynamic as possible and to be able to provide a wider uh, swath of coverage. And, and frankly, you know, uh, you know, paper stuff because of the process of it, it, it slows us down. In fact, in, in that it, it really does, yeah. you know, and, and we, we like to be, you know, we like to, to be flexible we like to be fluid we like to be able to get stuff out there and people will know that from following our you know our, our twitter for an example you know the sixteen thousand plus people that are on there you know we're very active in getting content out there but we want to make sure we spread that across other uh platforms where people are you know watching and viewing and we've seen that you know audience grow in, on all different aspects of it there and if we can do more and even if it's in smaller bits, longer bits, whatever form it takes uh, to provide information for people, entertainment mm-hmm. for people, uh, for connection to the golf community, it's just going to make it better for everyone. Well, the funny thing is, is that, and we found this out a little bit when we had uh, a while back when we had launched a, a version of Flagstick into Central Ontario. Right. What your readers want hmm. or what your audience wants or likes is not necessarily what your marketing partners desire and with the print version of flagstick especially yeah. after the whole covid thing right um the appetite for spending money on print marketing diminished significantly it was always a bit of a struggle with print 
you know, we were flagstick, so it was a little bit different than with other print projects, but that how do we gauge response? How do we know if people see it? It was really hard to, to you know, continue to go every year the same, the same answer, the same question, which really right. don't have an answer to. Yeah. How do you gauge response? You can't really in, in a print. You can't phone calls, emails, but you do so much other stuff unless everybody's telling you it's hard exactly to metrics where on it. it doesn't work. So this yeah. digital net neat, this digital um, uh, version of everything is, is what the industry yeah. i.e. your marketing partners yeah. desire especially the bigger ones the manufacturers like uh, you know we have tailor-made srixon ping mm-hmm. um cleveland yeah. golf pei yeah. you know these marketing partners want mm-hmm. digital marketing they don't yeah, and, want they, and, and, they, and, they, and, they flat out tell us we, in the, we're not in the interested end, in print so yeah, in the end it's about reaching the audience and you know while we appreciate you know long form stuff that doesn't mean we're not going to have long form stuff no. on our website you know, we're just going to provide it in a different format for sure. And exactly. um, again, it, it's flexibility, uh, visual content as well. You know, obviously plans for more of that. You know, this is visual, although we have a, you know, our, our majority of our audience right now is on audio more than anything, which mm-hmm. you know, thanks to everyone on, on uh, you know, Apple, Spotify, yeah. uh, Audible, Google, Google. Google pods, good pods. There's like a ton of different platforms and thank you to good pods actually for uh, making us the podcast of the week uh, a couple of weeks ago. That was yes. nice to see. Um, that was, that was kind of cool. Ooh, and uh, you, you know, one. yeah, we just appreciate the, uh, <laughs> we just pre- appreciate the response of everyone. And, and like I said, the, you know, we have so much information and so many things that we want to share uh, and we just want to make that better for our audience. So uh, appreciate any feedback for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, let you know, you know, we've got lots of plans for lots of things we'll be doing uh, in the year ahead. We certainly do. Um, okay, well, we got another great show lined up for this week. Um, we're uh, we got some some news and information discussion items for the front nine that we want to get to, and in the back yep. nine, we're going to talk a little bit about putting equipment mm. practice and how to get better um, in all facets, not just yeah. not just instructional, no, uh, no, no, but no, no, no. in in other areas as well. So this should be an interesting little topic in the back nine. But yeah. um, you know, let's let's uh, get to the front nine. Uh, brought to you by Metcalf Golf Club, natural setting, a pleasant challenge. And if anybody's looked outside right now, they'll know that golf season is probably a lot closer than you think. <laughs> and uh, we don't, uh, you don't want to wait to save on golf this season. Buy a membership, join a league, purchase some golf game packs, and be ready to hit the first tee when that snow is gone. Visit MetcalfGolf.com to shop now. Um, okay, Scott. Let's uh, let, let's start things off with the uh, with the um, the flagstick open update because <laughs> one one week one week ago, yeah, we, one week we ago on this podcast, registra- yeah, we announced we, the registration. <laughs> yeah, it was open, and oh within twenty four less than twenty four hours, yeah, after opening the registration, we had eighty registrations. Yeah, less than twenty four hours. The tournament maxes out at 120, and it's a it's a hard 120. Yeah. So this is not a oh I can do 121 or 120. No, no. It's, we run in foursomes now, not threes. Yeah. Uh, so there's no room to slip a foursome in. It's it, it is exactly we're on a very tight yeah. tight time crunch with the with things. So it's a hard 120. Yeah. Well, here we're we almost, are a week later. Yeah. And I just looked, and we're at Uh-oh. 116. Okay, so so they're unfortunately, if you're listening to this right now, you're probably too you're late. On the it's probably list. 120. <laughs> yeah, you're on the waiting list. So. We can uh, we could probably safely say at this point that the uh, flagstick open for 2023 is, is completely sold out, sold out yeah. and that any registrations that come in beyond the 120 go automatically on the. Okay, let me let me make sure that people know this that this yeah. is how it works. It's a waitlist setup. Golf Genius, an amazing system for doing. Uh, tournament operations bookings this this system is amazing love it been using it for quite a while but we have a it's a wait list set up as soon as we cap the 120 it shuts off the direct registration and payment system after the 120 you register as if you were registering for the tournament it collects all your information your credit card information everything but it does not charge you for anything until i take you off the wait list and put you directly into the event as soon as that happens then you're charged for your entry and away we go. And that happens. And I guarantee it will happen. So yeah. Oh, yeah. 
don't think because we're at 120, you're not going to get in. Last year, yeah. we had a, a rather long waiting list, but about half the people off the waiting list ended up getting in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing is, happens. is that, yeah, it happens. People switch in and out. It's a May long mm -hmm. weekend. They all of a sudden have other weekend plans. There might be family emergencies, travel issues. You never know. Like we have 12 guys coming down from Timmins this year. Mm -hmm. So you never know as far as travel logistics and stuff, if that gets reduced, whatever. So yeah. whatever the case, what Jeff is saying is, you know, exactly right. Don't be discouraged. Get yourself on the waiting list and you never know. You're going to might have a chance to, to get in there. I don't exactly. know if you heard my phone ding there. Sorry about that. No. But that See, was, I wouldn't uh, have if you didn't bring it up. That was actually uh, <laughs> Brad Boyle, who uh, works for Trackman now, former uh, PGA Tour Canada member. We were having a discussion this morning about last week's podcast and, okay. uh, and uh, how much he enjoyed it. He had just listened to it and, and appreciated it. So uh, shout out to, to Brad there for uh, for that listen and, and giving the feedback. Uh, we love that feedback. It's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nothing improves without some level of criticism, constructive or otherwise, yeah. and uh, feedback, information, ideas, suggestions. Yeah. we're all about it rolling this podcast it. yeah it yeah. shapes this podcast it really does i mean okay. a lot of the times a lot of the things that we'll bring up here uh will you know come from obviously our normal news gathering and so forth but you know if we look at the topics and things on the back end a lot of times it'll be things that are you know coming top of mind because people are talking about it mm -hmm. suggesting it having conversations and you know you should know i have endless conversations daily with so so many yep. people which is great because you know that's where we get everything from and it's never a burden happy to reply to them all the time exactly exactly um okay so last year was i mean last year we talked about hall of fame you were mm -hmm. uh you were inducted into the uh ontario golf hall of fame uh, uh lauren rubenstein, lauren award. rubenstein award winner yep um joe was inducted into the joe mclean Yep. Um, was inducted into the uh, Ottawa Valley Golf Association Hall of Fame. Um, and this year, we, we've just received the the list of the inductees for the uh, 2023 uh, OVGA Hall of Fame. Yep. And uh, wow, I mean, the the, the four Good inductees, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll call it five inductees. We'll call even, it five. I, it's I, five. We'll call it five inductees because as it should be. Yeah. Um, in the player category, Brad Fritch, yep. Alan McGee, yep. and Susan Pearl. Yeah. I mean, awesome. they, uh, well, we'll get to the builder category in a second, but the yeah, three sure. player category, I mean, honestly, uh, you you're easy. not <laughs> pretty pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, as yeah. far as as far as the uh, I mean, I know that it's not an easy time. Sorry, selection committee, don't get on my case. No, I know no, no, it's not this, an easy process, no, but no, those no. were three yeah. three pretty easy uh, yays, if you ask yeah. me, if you're sitting around the table going, should they? Uh, yeah. Yay. Yeah, I mean, this is, you got to remember, the OBJ Hall of Fame was uh, established in 2021. So at this point right now, obviously, they had a very, you know, big first class. Um, but, you know, they've got to take care of a lot of low-hanging fruit <laughs> first. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of history there. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure the decisions while they you know there's going to be some debate back and forth on this person or this person or should they go in this year or this one's not much of a debate no i think these ones are were pretty easy and you know it, it's nice for us because these are obviously people that we're very familiar with because they are all within our era uh, mm -hmm. of coverage whereas you know sometimes when you have people that are you know a more historical context you're not familiar with them you know people are not from are familiar with them as well you know just generally golfers of this generation uh so it's been neat to see just you know since we put it out there yesterday just the response to the people because mm. you know they all know these people so yeah it, 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 these are see, yeah so. exceptional now yeah. um well at some point or another we'll we'll try to have some some on-camera yeah. conversations with Definitely. all of the inductees this year this is just sort of this was just announced so this is just the preliminary let's get it out there yeah. quick conversation uh in the builder category um, I got to say this one, this one is just a very, very spot impressive on. and um, spot on, you're right, spot on decision in the build a category to have Kevin and Lisa Haim yeah. uh, inducted into the uh, Ottawa Valley Golf Association Hall of Fame in the builder category. Because right. I will tell you this, if this were Kevin being inducted in the player category, yeah, that would make probably sense equally sure. as fitting, uh, yeah, given sure. his successes as a professional. Yeah, as and an I'm amateur. sure that will happen at some point. I, I would imagine it will too. But for Kevin and Lisa, what they, what the two of them have done 
for golf, particularly mm-hmm. junior golf. Um, yeah. And what they've done since, I mean, I'm trying to think and go back 12 to plus 19, years. It's 12 what, plus years. Yeah. 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, it was 12 years leading into now. They, they, they paused it obviously uh, because of COVID in 2020, but we're talking about the Kevin Haim junior golf initiative yeah. here. But in that time, um, you know, they generated money just for one aspect of it yeah. for over 700 annual memberships. Uh, for junior golfers in the Ottawa area, which is Incredible. amazing. On top of on top of the resources that they used to provide to a lot of other programs as well, I think mm-hmm. I think that gets uh, I don't think that gets enough coverage. Um, and that um, on top of that, I mean, how much work has to go into it? And obviously, you know, Lisa does a, a ton of that. As Kevin said, he gets to be the face, and Lisa gets to do the work. But well, um, I mean, you know, Kevin the, Kevin's teaching too. I mean, that's yeah, the thing. Like that, with all yeah. that going on, and Lisa's you know running running the show from you know from the background a little for yeah. the most part. I mean, she's far but in from the in initiative. The I mean, you know, yeah. She, I mean, it's, it's the, it's not only the, the memberships, it's the other programs that they've reached out to. Mm-hmm. Cause I know of other golf clubs yep. uh, where they've reached out to and provided funding uh, to help out, whether that's, you know, the junior golf showcase down at loyalist or yep. other, other aspiring young golfers and things like that. And other charities as well. That's mm-hmm. the other thing that's part of this program is it's not just tied to golf, uh, whether it's a snowsuit fund or anything else, there's a lot of other kids related charities that it's given back to. So, well, yeah. and you got to go back a little bit. I mean, we'll, we'll, we don't want to get too deep into this because we will get, we will get Kevin and Lisa both on the on yeah, the podcast sure. at some point or other, but you have to go back, I, you know, to the, to the, uh, when double debt golf center was, mm. was built and, they were connected, like they were, they were married at that point. They were, it was Kevin and Lisa, you know, that yeah. was the, the, they were running, like this started way back then. I mean, what they're yeah. doing now with the initiative and all that stuff, that's, that's in the last 10, 12 years. Yeah. What the, 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 Clubs the partnership and, and what stuff. they did for, have done yeah. for golf goes far beyond yeah, the exactly. last 10 or 12 years. So congratulations to yeah. Kevin and Lisa Everyone. Haim uh, yeah. for being inducted in the builder category and, for Brad Fritch, Alan McGee, and Susan Pearl, awesome selections being inducted mm-hmm. in the players category. Looking forward to having uh, deeper conversations yes. and discussions with all, all four or five of them yeah. uh, in the future. So, Yeah, I exchanged texts with uh, Brad yesterday, and he said that was a fun call to get Joe McLean, who's uh, obviously yes. served on the committee. He, actually, he made the uh, call? He made the call. Nice. And uh, so Brad was was delighted at that. So, yeah, no problem to, you know, to get him on here at some time. He, he certainly likes to talk a little bit of golf that's for sure no no question no yeah, question good stuff um obj schedule uh yeah. is uh up it is and um uh, available yeah. on on the obj's website but you can access it through flagstick.com pretty easily as well yeah, uh, yeah. is there anything in particular that uh you know with the schedule scott that that we need to discuss or just the fact yeah that just it's... a couple of quick things i mean uh like you said it's posted up at flagstick.com it's also there in a downloadable format uh they have a poster that's available a pdf so if you want to quickly do that uh there's a couple of uh items left that are uh tbd they're mostly a couple in the junior category uh and the women's the ethel ferguson uh, mm-hmm. just to kind of clarify the se- season gets kicked off in may uh first event of the year is on the junior side it'll be the junior spring classic it's going to be at the meadows and the adult uh, side of things kicks off with the two-player uh, spring scramble uh, at the Meadows as well. I guess the biggest thing that people look for, you know, obviously intersectionals are at clubs all around the area, but uh, the city and district championship this year, which will uh, run on uh, July 10th, 11th, and 12th, uh, will be at Greensmere, Lock March, and Eagle Creek. So that's probably the big highlight that everybody looks forward to every year. Uh, it's the big one on the schedule. Now, I, I guess this is not... And this is not all written and said and done yet, but have um, has there been Scott? Do you know of any resolution? No, uh, to the intersectional situation. No, there's uh, you know, and and I, I don't think we can give much detail on it, but let's just say there's some discussion uh, between the owners and. Uh, um, the OVGA and they're talking about obviously some hosting stuff, some continuing things about, you know, hosting and pressures on clubs to do some hosting. Uh, as far as I know, it's everything is status quo at this point. Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Sounds good. Um, now a little piece of information that we just found out before we started recording, mm-hmm. uh, about the nation golf club. Yeah. Um, out in Plantagenet mm-hmm. near Wendover. For those yes. of you that don't know where the Nation <laughs> Golf Club is, it's in the East End. <laughs> yes, it is. 
Um, they're they're doing something a little unique this year with a with a twelve hole loop. Yeah, I just uh, just got word that they're uh, going to offer a twelve hole option after one o'clock. Uh, don't have many details of it. Uh, here it's holes uh, seven through eighteen, uh, which is kind of a natural loop for them. Uh, I'll be looking for more details of it, but th it's an interesting option. I think it's I think it's neat uh, uh, that they're going to do it after one o'clock. I guess it may be for people that are looking for twilight golf and maybe want a little bit more than nine. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a set option for them rather than just saying twilight, play as many holes as you can, uh, allowing them to start on seven. I don't know what the situation is. They probably have a lot of people. If you look within the membership, mm -hmm. they probably, probably, probably play do, that loop. They probably play that loop already. And I know that from being at different golf courses where there's natural loops or things that are there. Uh, I'm curious from an operation standpoint, and I'll try to get this answer uh, of how they're going to schedule that, uh, you know, after one o'clock and how people are going through and they're going to fit the groups in there to come in at seven o'clock. But I'm sure they've, I'm sure they've given it some thought. Well, one would think if they're, if they're announcing that they're going to do it, that they figured out how logistically, how they're going to, yeah how they're going to do it um i mean does that appeal yeah. to you like a 12 minute 12 uh, you know, hole loop it does um it, it does any, appeal any to me a nine? little bit but i'm kind of like i don't know i'm still kind of a nine or 18 maybe like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's a natural your golf course is built as nine and 18 if both nines loop back Some to the club now yeah now when it would make sense to me is mm -hmm. if you're offering a nine hole rate to play your golf course but your nine your front nine doesn't loop back Right. Yeah. So, like for instance, uh, let, oh, I'll give you an example: Metcalf Golf Course. Okay. Okay. They have uh, they have not a two an eighteen hole and a nine hole golf course. Right. They do offer a nine hole rate on the eighteen hole golf course. Right. But the ninth hole does not come back to the clubhouse. Mm. The ninth hole ends almost at the furthest. Oh very, yeah, it's in the, very far in end. the middle, middle far back of the exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so there is. No, the only way you could do it, you could do a 12 hole loop there where you play one through nine and then come over and pick up 16, 17, 18. Right. You but know, and then again, then you've how, got, do you, you know, how do you do it from a logistics standpoint? Well, that's the point. That's, like, there's that's a situation where there's a natural loop yeah. that would bring you back after 12 holes. But if I were playing, which I might, which I would probably take more advantage of. Right. And say, okay, well, I'll play 12 and that brings me back to the clubhouse rather than play nine and have to stop and walk all the way back in. Mm -hmm. from you know from the ninth hole right not that there's anything wrong guys with stopping on the ninth where it is i'm just saying for me no 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 for sure if it's a nine i would take the 12 hole option and play the other three holes if right. i could just play the 12 holes if i had to yeah. wait for three groups to go through the 16th hole before i teed off on 16 to play my, then i'm walking i could walk yeah. in by then so it makes yeah, no yeah, difference yeah. so in that respect sure but yeah. you know i don't know I'd be curious. You know what? If anybody wants to give us feedback, do your golf course that you play at now offer mm -hmm. a uh, an option that's not yeah, let nine us know. or eighteen? I, I'd be curious, but I also want to see how they do that. I mean, yeah. I know I know there's a golf course in in the Durham area, Bunker Hill, that I remember when it opened and doing a big story on it or whatever. Uh, it's two six holes, uh, okay. so it's a twelve hole course as it is, and then it offers you you know to play it you know, three times or yeah. whatever. And, and that's built that way. Okay. Whereas a lot of other golf courses are not. So yeah, I'm just curious as far as logistics, but you know, if they've got the demand for it, which, yeah. you know, they probably have, that's probably why they're responding to it, but I'll find that out. Yeah. I was just saying in the meantime, we'll, we'll reach out to, uh, to yeah, uh, the, the management yep. out at the nation golf club and, and yep. ask just, you know, some, some questions. Get some yeah, answers sure. for yeah, you. And curious. in the meantime, anybody listening or, or watching the podcast um, that wants to reach out to us and let us know something about their golf course, whether you're a member there or whether you're owner or management there, um, let us know. And yeah. uh, maybe it's a discussion point for one of one of the podcasts is mm -hmm. something we can uh, we can have a an in-depth discussion. It touches, about. touches back to our one last week. So. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. OK, now. We wanted to touch on the Twitter poll this week, but we got about we got about we got about five minutes before we have yeah. to take break. I have a feeling this might take longer than five minutes. So no, do I wanna, don't think so. But I'll give you. You don't some think context. so? Do you want to try to squeeze it in? Okay, we'll yeah. we'll try to squeeze it in before the break. Okay. Okay. So it was put out there on Twitter. Yeah. At Flagstick on Twitter, would you prefer to attend the Masters on Sunday, or the Waste Management Phoenix Open with a guaranteed seat on the 16th hole? Yeah. And overwhelmingly right now <laughs> yeah and i gotta say i'm 
I'm the opposite on this one. Okay. Um, overwhelmingly, almost 90% of the respondents yeah. say they'd rather see the Sunday Masters yeah. than attend the Waste Management Phoenix Open yeah. uh, 16th hole. I'm kind of, I'm sorry. I think I'm going to, I, I, I would love to go to the Masters once at some right. point or another. So maybe I'm yeah, kind of skewed on this it, question. Maybe that plays into it. Yeah, for sure. You know, but if I, if I, I would rather sit in the grandstands on the sixth. I think that would just be an absolute. Well, here's the, like, here's the thing. see some here's... amazing golf shots. Yeah, to a hundred and sixty no. yard hole. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you the con. I'll give you the context to it or whatever. So first off, um, you know it's obviously going to be skewed. There's going to be some bias based on our audience as far as a golf audience that's there right. or whatever. Whoever's, uh, you know, responding to this. Um, there was about five hundred votes for this, mm-hmm. which was you know decent as far as that's concerned. But it really came from a discussion with somebody who will remain unnamed who argued with me and said, "Oh." everybody would would pick the waste management phoenix oh of course everybody everybody and i always love that because it's like okay that's the the go-to right Right. everybody loves this yeah Yeah. well the thing is you can always represent your own opinion but you don't know what's going on in everybody else's head so apparently everybody does not no agree with this person so i you know put the poll up not to spite (laughs) the person but just to show them for an example what an audience might see and yeah you obviously saw what the responses were it's not even close it's not even close that said you know when we deal with it um you know it depends what you're looking for as far as being in a tournament people have to realize and there was a good response from somebody regarding the tournament that um you know i'd rather watch sunday at the masters at home where i could see everything actually happening and that's the difficult part with live coverage that's where i'm at right you can't really see everything so it's very difficult to follow the tournament whereas something that you know at the phoenix open you're there to watch the 16th and to be entertained and to to do that Mm -hmm. aspect of it or whatever um these are markedly probably very different audiences uh that are responding to these particular things and liking one way or the other uh so you know again it's not definitive but it just shows you sort of the flavor especially when it skews this much yeah i mean a lot of the polls you put out there that you know there's there's now maybe if there was a third option in here then then it might get split but you Mm -hmm. know you throw a third option in there of being able to uh you know attend and watch um the sunday or something at the open championship or at the u.s open um i don't think the u.s open would tip the scale for me but the open championship might depending on the Mm -hmm. venue yeah Um, well i think i do like watch i do like the the i do like with the open championship depending on the venue how how much things can change based on the golf course, especially on a Sunday. Um, I don't know that the masters, I know there's always been some drama, but I think there's, I feel like there's less drama now with all the changes they make to the golf course that it's not, it's not the same to me. It's not the same. I still love me. It's still one of my favorites of the, of the four majors. It's, it's number three. Um, I, guess, I guess we have a future podcast. Don't yes, we? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, because no, we won't go any further with it right. than that. But yeah, your choice, I would imagine, is Sunday at the Masters. Uh, I I think so, and and uh, you know, uh, again, that's just a personal preference, kind of more than anything. And I, I didn't want to put a third option there because it just doesn't give people, you know, it it creates confusion because and all you sudden, couldn't prove your point. Well, I couldn't prove my point, but it also it also comes to the you know when you're talking about the Masters on Sunday or the Open, it's yeah, it becomes a harder decision. This is more polarized one way or the other. Exactly. So chances are you're going to have less people go undecided, which I didn't offer. Um, it's like but, McDavid, Matthews, LeBron, right. yeah, 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 MJ, yeah, 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 Masters, yeah, 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 yeah. Phoenix so, Open, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. You know? So I mean, I that mean, said, you know, the Phoenix Open is going to be it's fun to watch. So it is, it certainly yeah. is. Once you um okay all right good pull uh good front nine solid we'll call that even par um we're gonna make the turn take a break and uh, when we come back we're gonna get into a little let's talk putting so uh stay with us you're listening to the uh, flagstick podcast uh we'll be right back when you golf on prince edward island there are over 400 fairways closer than you can imagine Not to mention countless miles of pristine beaches and a rich world-class culinary experience. 
So get here fast, then take it slow and play around on island time. Golf Prince Edward Island. And welcome back to the Flagstick Podcast with uh, myself, Jeff Botter, and uh, of course, Scott McLeod. Um, we're going to talk putting. Yeah. Talk some putting. Um, our relationship. <laughs> with our relation our relationship with putting <laughs> yeah, um okay bit. so let's talk putting yeah here on the back nine on the back nine yes, yes the back nine which of course is presented by golf sim gurus uh work on your game all year round in the privacy of your own home custom golf simulator setups built to your specs to fit your budget visit golf to learn more you got it back okay. nine is where we need to have good putting <laughs> yeah but uh yeah especially especially uh yeah yeah the front thing, nine didn't go I'll, so well you better you better yeah. get the flat stick rolling pretty good on the back nine or so so one thing about this is that you know obviously uh, i hear a lot of people especially this time of year as they're getting ready for the year they tend to be worried about their golf swing more than mm -hmm. anything and i understand uh we can probably work on that a little bit easier than we can uh, you know, maybe putting inside or things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, I will say that, um, you know, putting needs a little bit more discussion, a little bit more attention, uh, especially when you consider how much it's involved with scoring. Yeah. Um, and I always joke and, and say, you know, people don't think they're bad putters because they never hit a putt out of bounds, <laughs> but uh, which is true, right? <laughs> oh, so when you think about that, so people look at it from a degree of their ability to putt and they th think they're a good putter when maybe they're not just because it doesn't look as bad. But, you know, let's let's get started, though, with talking when you said our relationship with putting. I mean, what's kind of sort of putting meant to you over the years? How have you sort of thought about it, you know, practiced? Do you care about it that much? What's, what's your relationship with putting? Well, I mean, for me, what my relationship has uh, was with putting versus what my relationship is with putting, they're two totally different things. Nowadays, okay. I wouldn't say that I'm too overly focused on working on any aspect of my game. I, yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't mean that. I don't mean that to be a bad thing. It's just no. you know, I don't have, I don't have the inclination. Sorry, it's not even the inclination. I don't care how I play. Honestly, okay. I mean, I, I don't want to suck. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I've been playing long enough now. I know my golf swing well enough now to know what I'm going to get most times when I go to the golf course. Mm -hmm. And I, I get it. And I score pretty much the same way pretty much every time I play. I don't mm -hmm. really do anything spectacular and I don't really do anything. Okay. Know, well, that that ridiculous. said. But when it, when it comes to my relationship with putting. Yeah. History books like would show. I like putting. putting. Okay. I am good at putting. Mm -hmm. um, it saves my bacon a lot. <laughs> um yep. my short game as a whole aside from the occasional you know right don't say it don't say it don't say it Shot nobody to wants the right. to hear that word um <laughs> a, 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 aside from an occasional little yip with my lateral, lateral yeah shot. my lateral yip with my <laughs> chipping yeah my short game uh for the most part is pretty good and saves my game it helps me score a lot which is right. where we're where we're kind of going with this yeah so sure. my relationship with putting is yes i like putting um, I would rather be on the green than off the green, of you know, as far as, you know, if I'm two putting, I'd rather, yeah. but I'm confident in my putting from pretty much anywhere, uphill, downhill, side hill, big breaks, slow greens, fast greens. It doesn't really matter to me. I, I get a feel for my distances pretty quick. And um, so, I mean, I guess that would be my, my relationship yeah. with putting. It's, yeah, it's, I think it's that, not I think a love hate. No, no, no. But I think I think that's something that people have to think about because um, when we start to talk about putting, generally the people that don't like putting uh, are the ones that are poor at putting. Mm -hmm. um, they generally tend to be the ones that don't practice at it because they tend to lean towards the skills that they're good at. That's you know just that confirmation bias that you know we're if we're good at something we tend not to practice it as much. Uh, it's harder to practice the things we're, we're bad at. So yeah. uh, usually that, you know, discussion when I have that with anybody about their relationship with putting, do you like putting? Do you not putting? It's rare to find somebody that says, I'm terrible at putting, but I love to putt. Yeah, you know, yeah and that, they don't go it, hand in hand. They, they generally don't. So, you know, again, if somebody puts that as a goal or whatever, they have to examine that and examine that sort of 
you know, what is that relationship with putting? Do they avoid it? I mean, yeah. I know I've you been, like putting. Yeah, but I've been pretty lonely on the putting green over the years when I go to yeah. practice it. Um, I would say I liked putting. I didn't really think uh, it had as much value when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I didn't really appreciate all the aspects of it. And I learned to, I learned to appreciate it more and realize that what I thought was a strength in my game wasn't as strong as I thought it was. Well, um, and it was less to do with technical aspects and we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. It, it was more to do to some other aspects of it. But again, it, it's about understanding of, Oh, where am I actually at with putting? Well, it's funny because when you, we've had conversations we've covered a lot of uh, of professional golf events over the years yep. in, including PGA tour events sure. and i would say the one common thing that is that that is said about the difference between guys on the PGA tour that are winning and making mm -hmm. money and the guys that are at the bottom of that list or on the are are not up on the PGA tour is putting the the Definitely. difference is Definitely. That they make a lot more putts. They yeah. they make a lot more ten footers and twelve footers, and yeah. don't miss three footers and two footers very often, if at all. Mm -hmm. And get the twenty footers and thirty footers close and make a lot of those. Mm, that's, that's the, big the one. to me. That's yeah. the difference. I mean, why was yeah. why was Tiger so like he had a crazy good short game? Yeah, and he could putt. Ben Crenshaw yeah. could putt. Brad Faxon could putt. Yeah, and guys it, could it, putt. It, it, and good putters, uh, you know, it tends to overcome other aspects of the game. Brad Faxon's a great example. And, you know, uh, you know, and, and we'll probably, um, we can make use of that. I did an interview a, a few years back with him there. Uh, and you can hear, you know, he said, you know, he wasn't a great ball striker. He was a very crooked ball striker, but he made up with it, with, with everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and you start to look at the stats of the players that usually when they're having success, yes, you know, there's can be incremental gains as far as, um, you know, off the tee. Uh, hitting the ball closer, it's there to benefit their putting more than anything. Yeah, exactly. And really, if you look at most amateurs playing, bogey avoidance or three-putt avoidance is a huge way to progress their scores. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's at every level of the game is yes. not putting yourself in peril so that, you know, you're not left with those nervy, you know, four and five footers, uh, you know, if you putt those within your mm -hmm. game. You know, some people don't or whatever. Um, but I think that's that's the thing is that people have to, uh, learn to embrace putting and, and yeah. love it a little bit more if they're going to have a positive relationship with it if if right away in their head they're like i hate to putt i hate to putt no. well, chances are they're not probably gonna not gonna be a good putter time. yeah and their chances are they're not going to get better at it or whatever well wait, so, i mean remember mike weir wins the masters oh yeah it was what one what oh my God. what no one part of mike weir's game oh that weekend won mike weir oh, yeah. the masters it certainly wasn't his driving distance no or his sure. ball striking yeah. i mean his ball striking didn't hurt him but at no. the same time the, the one thing that Mike Weir did all weekend long was make pots, yeah, make yeah, five including footers, a very six footers, big one footers. on 18 in regulation to go to playoff, right? Yeah. Like he just, yeah. Like it, that's, it, 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 yeah. It, it makes a difference. And it's a lot more, you know, it's a lot more complicated than people give it. I mean, we look at a golf bag and a golf bag, you know, with 14 clubs in it, and we have one putter. So for most people, they sort of, you know, make that, oh, it's only a little part of the game, you know, and that's the perception right away. But until you play the game, then you realize and understand it actually has more bearing on it. So um, there's a lot more things that we need to kind of dig into to to pay attention to it. So uh, first thing is that, you know, like you said, that relationship, the first thing that other people go to after that, and they always you know, it's the putter, right? I yeah. mean, we don't buy equipment, we buy hope. I continue to say that. Um, we normally, when people are not putting well, their first instinct is to do what? Not get a putting lesson. What do they nope. do? No, nope. go buy a new putter. Buy a new putter, right? Because it's some sort of magic stick and things that are out there. Now, you know, for you, what it, what's been your sort of uh, MO as far as your putting over the years, as far as putters? Okay. Uh, using putters which is interesting because people will people will be interested to hear this because jeff putts a little bit differently than most people yes yeah, so i uh, am a right-handed golfer but i yeah. have always been a left-handed putter now yeah. i still to this day believe that it's a hockey thing because i play golf right-handed but i shoot left in hockey and i've played hockey yeah. my whole life so I think it's just the, the the way my eyes see the ball when I'm over top of it, the way my arms swing when I'm when I'm making a putting stroke. But I'm a left-handed putter. Yep. And for the most part, over the years, 
I have always been a blade putter. Uh, like, uh, like my first putter was, uh, was an old Northwestern, uh, alloy putter. Loved it. Still have it in the basement. God's honest truth. I've gotten rid of most of my putters over the years. That one still exists downstairs. I probably will never pull it out. The thing I think most really... of my first putters are uh, long gone. They, yeah. <laughs> they might've expired, uh, due to death. Disintegrated. <laughs> um, but I've always been, I had, uh, I had a, uh, um, an Odyssey 550, uh putter yeah, I remember that one yeah. um which was kind 90s. of an old bladed yeah. ping style and ping mm-hmm. answer style putter um i've had a ping answer i've had a couple of ping answers um i've had a tailor-made nubbins putter uh which my was a uh, what's that my condolences yeah i know i think i might still have that one downstairs too for some yeah reason. you can burn that one if you like um, or just put it in a museum that's exactly <laughs> um i and then i i did the last putter that i used was a uh a nike midnight Hmm. um yep. love that putter used it for a long long time that was probably the one putter that was in my bag for a long time i've gone yeah, through was. the odyssey two ball mallets and i had a uh i had a um uh Bettinardi, uh big ben oh yeah um, i almost rem- forget about some of those you know yeah. What I mean? <laughs> yeah it was a good putter but man it was lively that thing um and all my putters are always short just right. to let you know they're always super short like 33 32 33 inches um the way i like to stand over the ball open stance kind of thing but my putter now is a is a uh uh, cleveland Mm -hmm. uh putter and it's a mallet style putter uh, a little bit bigger um but and i and i really like it i used it all last year really liked it so uh you know why there's been been a lot of variety why why the change to a mallet because like you said you were a blade the whole time because just because I had that. a blade putter for so long, um, right. when when I when I uh, looked at the the Cleveland putters, that mm-hmm. one just kind of the way it sat, it just right. really kind of looked appealing, mm-hmm. and I wanted to just try something different because I didn't see the point in switching to a new putter that was exactly the same style and shape as the one I just had. I didn't think like if I'm going to change putters at this stage of the game, then I'm going to change putters to something that's that's completely different. Right. than what i've had because if i'm not happy with it i can always go grab that one back out of my bat at my basement you go and, back and to the northwestern it. if you need to right i don't know what that thing would be like <laughs> that thing would probably feel like especially with today's golf ball being as soft as it is i yeah. mean that putter was pretty was alloy right so it was a pretty right. soft putter Mushy. to begin with yeah. with the with the old pinnacle balls and the you know the hard yeah, sterling rocks yeah. Yeah. now with the, pu- the balls being so soft that you know i don't know if that, that putter might be really garbagey yeah i don't know uh, i mean what about you like i mean i, I know I've, i pretty much have seen <laughs> yeah, most of the putters you've had over the years yeah. I, I would say uh if i look at the last 20 years uh, i've had four putters consistently within that yeah. and i've had pretty long stretches uh with the putters and i'll, I'll i will say the last two putters that i've had uh were totally shaped uh, from fitting more than anything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I go back to, you know, remember that STX uh, thing that I had or yeah. whatever. I had that yeah. for about five years or whatever. And I putted well with it. But again, it was more instinctive. It was just kind of like, I like the shape of it. I do what it, there wasn't anything really scientific about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I progressed there. I remember I had a yes C groove, uh, Sophia set a center shafted yeah. thing for a while. Uh, again, you know, like the look of it, like the alignment of it. Uh, that was a big thing. And then uh, what happened was I happened to be on a Quintic, uh, basically a launch monitor for for uh, for putters, and went through a fitting, and I found out some things about me and how I launched the golf ball, and you know how I tend to deliver a little bit more loft, and um, you know my strike sometimes wander a little bit out towards the toe and you know as a result of it uh, I ended up with some putter designs that were um, uh, flatter, uh, less loft on it. Uh, and again, that can vary and depend on, on the conditions of where you're playing. Uh, and then um, I end up going to a counterbalance putter. First, I had a, okay. uh, a spider for quite some time, a daddy long legs. Uh, I went to that <laughs> and I still have it. I actually rolled it the other day just to kind of have a look at it. It was just kind of funny just to see it. And, and then uh, and then basically uh, I moved over to a uh, Scotty Cameron, very similar model, uh, a 6M dual balance, which, you know, kind of the same thing, longer. Uh, what happens for me with the counterbalance putter is it 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 uh, it slows my uh, it slows my intention or my sort of bias to add loft. Okay. Um, 
So I have the mallet for a little bit more stability, um, but the dual balance gets me from getting, you know, the, the adding extra loft on it. So the ball tends to roll more consistently. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, again, uh, tried to stick with that as much as possible and realize that, you know, scientifically it fits me. Uh, I need to work on my stroke and, and things exactly. around that. And that's when I started to then start to look into more of my, my mechanics of, of my stroke. Cause I don't have, you know, I think I mentioned this before. I don't really have a swing coach myself as my swing coach. I have some other friends and stuff that will look at things and, and uh, you know, maybe they should have looked at it harder over the years or whatever, yeah. <laughs> including myself, but, you know, but I've been doing that. I've been working hard on that. Um, but I will say, you know, the lessons that I have taken uh, putting, you know, I took a putting lesson and I, I was fortunate to, uh, to get access to go down and do some work with John Graham. Uh, and I think it was about 2014 in, in Rochester. Uh, John has gone on to, um, you know, be a coach to currently uh, players like Justin Thomas and so forth. So got him early on. So the rate was a little less than it is now. Yeah, of um, course. But, you know, he started to look at, you know, sorry, he started to change my outlook right. uh, on putting and, and what I think about it and how to get better and what areas I need to improve. And I think when I get people come to me now and, and start to talk about uh, putting, uh, they usually have certain biases that they talk about here. I need to do this and I need to do this, but they don't really look at the full picture. And there's a lot right. of things. And you've actually mentioned some that one of them already when you talked about vision and stuff mm -hmm. like that there's definitely uh, some other elements so uh i would just say overall to kind of end that uh my styles of putters have been fairly consistent certainly had you know answers and lots of stuff and i'm like you i've got tons of putters uh, yeah. downstairs um you know but i'm not a guy to all of a sudden uh, i have a poor putting ground and i change putters i, I know yeah, it's no, beyond I that. that um so i think i'm on year five with my current putter and it's going into year six. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's where it's at with that. Yeah. The way I look at it when it comes to putting is it's like being, it's like being a bat, it's like being an excavator operator. You can have the, you can have the best state of the art excavator in the market, but if you have no idea how to use it, you're not right. going to be digging very yeah. many good holes. So yeah. Uh, really anybody nice in the anybody listening and watching in the construction business can appreciate that. Yeah. I think if you have if you put someone behind the the controls of a really expensive excavator that's never used one before, doesn't know what they're doing, they're yeah. probably not going to do a very good job. So no. you can have yeah. the most expensive, best state of the art, top of the line. Gosh, this is the Cadillac of putters. But if you don't know how to use it, it's probably not yeah. going to function very well for you for very long. Yeah, and you're going to end up trading it in and buying another. Mm. Uh, state of the art putter. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. the it important thing is it doesn't automatically make you better. It's it's just a tool in the end. So, Scott, I know there's some things that you know. I know there's things that, from an instructional point of view, that people can do to get better. You know, whether they work yeah. on their vision or their alignment, the physical mechanics of the putting stroke, which is important. Yeah. Uh, you know, learning how to judge speeds, learning how to read putts better, pick the lines. These are yeah. all things. Like, I mean, it's not just about going up, getting behind your ball, lining up the little logo where you think the putt, putt might go and hitting it i mean there is no. some there are there are some things to putting that yeah. you need to know and work on and understand to get better but uh, rather than get deep into the instructional mm -hmm. side yep. of things sure what are some of the routines or drills that somebody can very easily do without a golf instructor yeah. i mean we encourage you to go see oh, a pga definitely. of canada professional yeah. Uh, to to work on your putting stroke a little bit and give you proper things. But what are some things yeah. that somebody can just, okay, you know what? The golf courses are open or I've got a putting green in my basement mm -hmm. or whatever. So what can I do that yeah. is constructive mm -hmm. work yeah. to get better at putting as opposed to just going and throwing three balls down on the ground and hitting right. putts too rapidly to a hole? Yeah, and that instructor is important to make sure you're on the right path because mm -hmm. you can go literally. And you can you can go and write you can go and start working on stuff but if it's not things that are actually your problem you're just going to be spinning your wheels a little bit but uh you know first off you know we talked a lot about speed uh and speed control mm -hmm. and uh, i'll tell you in talking to um coaches that work on you know with some of the best players in the world uh they will come back with feedback in dealing with players and a player will tend to say they putted poorly and if they go and look at that uh, and they analyze what the player did, they'll tend to find that their speed was off. And mm -hmm. they also have criticism usually of the greens if their speed was off. 
And, and that's kind of interesting. And it's not because they're trying to do it intentionally. It's just their feel and their perception of, you know, their ability to do that. So one of the biggest things I would get people to do is to realize and understand that, you know, when you go to a golf course, every golf course is going to be different. Sometimes mm -hmm. the greens are different. Sometimes it's different, different times of day, just because you're at the same golf course. And, you know, you said, oh, well, the green speed was this and you, but then you're there the next day, things are different. Plus mm -hmm. you're different yep. every day we get up and we're different. So calibration is really, really important. So I would say one of the biggest drills uh, to work on, especially to work on, you know, from a speed standpoint, because you got to remember most amateurs will tend to have three putts because they can't control the speed. It's usually not because of the line, nope. right? The line ends up off because their speed is poor, right? But yeah, they but they th then they think that they picked the wrong line, but it really right. wasn't the line that they picked incorrectly. It was judging it's the a, speed. It's the speed more than anything. So one of the things I get everyone to do is go, if you've got a putting green at your golf course, hopefully you do. Uh, if you have to do this indoors and just kind of work on it, that's fine too. Um, we usually don't end up with a 20 foot, uh, you know, space indoors, but ideally be about 20 feet outside, find a flat spot, uh, put one T down, put one T on the other end, 20 feet away, and just work on that. And that's something you should do in your warm up. If you have no other option of something to do when you warm mm -hmm. up, just putt from T to T until you can just nail it every single time of that speed. And that's calibrating your brain and the response it has yeah. of how it's supposed to react and how much energy you're going to make with your stroke to apply that to the golf ball to get the speed right more than anything. Uh, and, and it seems really simple and straight out, but I'll tell you, LPJ, PJ tour, they're doing this all the time just to get the feel for that speed and to calibrate. It. And they're practicing all the time and they're playing all the time, mm -hmm. let alone the average amateur who is not practicing or playing more infrequently. I mean, if you're a weekly player and you just go out, I mean, going there and banging two footers on the putting green, it's not doing you any good. No, get, get the speed. So that speed drill where you kind of go T to T, uh, super, super important just to get the feel for the speed. So now here's the thing. I'm not a professional golf professional. I'm not an instructor, teacher, or anything. So my putting drill, yep. when I do work on my putting, if it's be usually before or after a round, a lot of times, you know, I hang around and putt after I'm done playing golf if I have time. But um, my drill for me is if there's not, if the putting green is not too busy and it has multiple holes or it has multiple pegs in the, in the ground, mm -hmm. I will take a half a dozen golf balls and and I'll be in one spot on that green and I will putt a ball to each one ball to each of the mm -hmm. the holes or so and this is you're talking about speed this is my way of figuring yep. out my speed so yep. rather than me sitting there and putting multiple balls to one hole until I figure yeah. out the speed yeah, the block I, is not doing any I putt to different or I'll use tees if I don't if that's an if that's not an option I'll put the tees in a straight line mm-hmm and the tees will all be at different lengths, and I'll putt to the first tee, then I'll putt yeah. to the far tee. So that's tee, a ladder. That's the... a ladder drill. Which yeah. Is great, so that's great how I do. like to do it. Yeah. I like to mix it up so that I it forces me to putt to a different distance every time. So it gives yeah. me an idea of what how how hard I have to hit it to go three feet, mm -hmm. how hard I have to hit it to go twenty feet, ten yeah. feet, and so on. You know, and right or wrong, I mean that's mm -hmm. not no, it's that's not like good... the most ultimate drill, but that's what no, I do to get a that's feel. A good... That's a good example of a variable practice so that you're going to different targets. You're using different inputs to determine what you're going to do. And, you know, if they're not flat, you're going to have to match your line and speed to get that mm -hmm. as close as possible. So that's I'm pretty good. comfortable with my, with, with lines when I'm putting, Yeah, judging the break of a putt, how much it breaks one way or the other. I'm pretty, pretty comfortable when I'm over a putt of figuring out, maybe it's a left-handed putter thing. Um, putts break differently. Mm -hmm. When you're left-handed, even though they break the same, they, they look different when they break. <laughs> um, so I feel like I have a better understanding of, of the lines. So I don't you worry see. about the line. When I look yeah. at it, I go, yeah, that's there's where it is. Now I'm yeah. all about speed. Yeah, I do not I, I like free you, putting. I would say you probably see it better. And, you know, you go back to those points that we won't get too deep into. Right. But if we look at vision related to alignment, and there's been a lot more study being done on this now. Uh, Gareth Rafleski, for an example, is using some really cool, uh, you know, goggles to look at your gaze and stuff like that. But uh, when you look at a player and see how they set up, if you look at their their angle of their head, where their position related to the golf ball, um, how high up and down they are as far as their head, it will change how you 
see the target or going from the golf ball to the target mm -hmm. and it will change that line. So it's very important to match that up to what is exactly happening because if you see that improperly, then your aim is generally going to be off and then your stroke has to go towards that. So that's a deeper thing you can dive into with an instructor. But a lot of times people will generally start to find their groove of where they see it better so that they can line it up much better that way. So, right. Yeah, um, no, I agree with that. Yeah, I for agree sure. With that. Um, what else on putting here? Uh, tools, Scott, like things mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, obviously we're in a modern era, so technology yeah. is, uh, it, it has become, has crept into the putting end of things as well. And there are some some technological tools that can be yeah. used to uh, to work on your putting. And, and you're familiar with, with these. Uh, oh, yeah. And you've used them all pretty much, I think. Yeah, too. So I have. What are some tools that, yeah. that people can use or instructors use to help with that stuff as well? Yeah, most of the thing that, uh, you know, we're using, whether it's tools like, you know, TrackMan, Sam Putt Lab, Quintic, uh, Hack Motion. I'll explain some of those in a second here, just briefly. Um, all they're used to do is to quantify what's going on and, mm -hmm. and really to measure what's going on and relate it back to what the results are. Um, so the whole idea of, you know, they're not the coach. Um, they're not, you know, it's not like you're pressing a button and one of these, you know, tools says, Hey, do this or do that. That's not really the case. No. Um, what it's doing is it's providing a, a measuring tape, just as simple as a, you know, if you're using a, um, a ruler and you're putting along a ruler just to, you know, check how easy you are or how easy it is for you to get a ball started on the, the right start line. That's yeah. just a tool. You're actually measuring, you know, where the golf ball is related to that as far as rolling it and, and knowing that it's probably moving, you've got the face open or closed or whatever. So again, these are just more advanced as far as tools. Uh, things like TrackMan, Sam Putt Lab and Quintic are, you know, are measuring things like uh, the club head movement, the roll, just their launch monitors, you know, for, for golf. Uh, for golf, for putting, just like they are as far as their swing, there's still impact conditions that are happening with uh, face variables, uh, rise as far as the putt, which is a, you know, kind of attack angle, the launch angle, uh, what's happening as far as the spin, the skid, um, you know, all these different things, the length of the stroke, the speed that it goes off. You mentioned different putters and how some putters would take off fast or slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's something we look at all the time with players, especially if they're changing putters. Um, there's a smash factor, you know, the club head speed versus the ball speed and what the output is, um, you know, that can vary from putter to putter. And if you can't get yourself calibrated to that, if all of a sudden you pick out a putter and all of a sudden you make the same stroke and the ball just shoots way off, you're going to have a hard time controlling your speed. But those are things that we can measure with something like a track band. Uh, hack motion that I put in there is really a wrist sensor. So we can look at 3D and how a person is moving. The key thing that I look at for hack motion is basically how somebody rotates the wrists open and closed as the working so that we can see how somebody is, um, you know, they're taking their backswing. They're going to have uh, a stroke that provides some rotation. We're going to see a little curvature in their, in their swing and their stroke. <laughs> right. But it's their ability to return that back to square and how they do that. When they do that, we can actually measure things like, are you changing your wrist condition so that you're adding loft or taking off loft? Um, you know, a lot of different tools that are there. So the cool thing here is that, you know, not everybody needs to dive into that. No. Nope. But they do provide a little deeper MRI when you go to find a problem for a golfer and, and to be able to see it really visually. Um, had a golfer a couple of years ago who would tend to get their wrists really high up tend to get the toe sort of down and get the face sort of open it changed their strike it changed the face angle and when you measured on 3d she could see that what she was actually doing mm -hmm. and realize that you know some of the myths that she'd been told about her putting stroke over the years of try this and try this had nothing to do with what she was actually doing and once she actually corrected that part of it it gave her you know the idea of oh okay here's what i need to do as opposed to applying all sorts of other remedies uh to something that really wasn't the problem and building around it so yeah it's great they're only going to progress there's going to be more and more of them yeah. Um, and again, they're only as valuable as, you know, the coach that you're working with or your understanding of what those variables are. There you go. So the moral of the story here or mm -hmm. the, to, to wrap up the whole putting topic yeah. is number one, focus more on your putting, work on it, mm -hmm. practice it with or without an instructor. As long as you're doing something, it's a good thing. 
Second, sometimes. <laughs> so, second, work yeah. work with a uh, a PGA candidate professional or or a putting instructor to figure out the mechanics, figure out what yeah. you may or may not be doing wrong, give you some drills and ideas that may help you with your putting. Yeah. Third, look at technology like uh, like TrackMan's, like Sam's Putt Lab, like Hack Motion. Uh, look at the technology that's out there to see if there's something there that might help you. Yeah. And fourth, and finally, if all else fails, institute the 20 foot gimme putt rule <laughs> and your putting will drastically improve round by round. I guarantee that. <laughs> that all you right. can guarantee. So, so yes. there you go. Awesome. Good stuff. Awesome. Well, what a great show once again. And throughout that show, we come up with a whole bunch of other ideas and topics that we could talk about on, on future shows. So See, this just keeps happening. Every show, there's another topic that it. comes out of that show to it lead is. to another show. So uh, next week, uh, we're not sure next week yet. Scott is away. I am. Um, doing some recon. <laughs> doing some product <laughs> testing, yeah. Um, so chances are we will uh, probably postpone next week until he gets back and uh, skip a week unless I feel like I can uh, carry a show by myself and that's not gonna happen. Or who knows? Uh, Maybe you I never can, know. Uh, I might just I might just pop up some day. Hey, yeah. here I am doing it by myself. Yeah, um, maybe I'll t- maybe I can check in from California. The only problem is, you know, we like to have a good audio setup for our yes, podcast. Exactly. Um, so you know, although I can, you know, check in from Zoom from away and stuff like that, we like to have good audio. Here's the topic so. for next week. I'm gonna talk about Scott behind his back. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. I can't All wait right. to tune in. I'm exactly I'm subscribing right now. Who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll bring on a guest host. Ah, uh, there you go. A secret guest host. I'll oh. muffle their voice. So you won't know who it is. Uh, uh, good stuff. <laughs> all right. Great show. As yep. always, uh, thank you to our sponsors, Metcalf Golf Club, Golf Sim Grooves, and our presenting sponsor this week again, Golf PEI. Uh, golf Prince Edward Island is a premier Canadian golf destination boasting the most golf courses per capita in the country with over 400 fairways. Closer than you can imagine, top tier accommodations, and speaking from experience, exquisite culinary experiences. It is the easiest golf vacation you will ever book. Book your golf vacations and tee times at golfpei.ca. Well, I'm glad you're listening. I'm glad you're watching. Uh, be sure to follow us across all the social media networks Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and like I said earlier, a soon coming TikTok. TikTok. Uh, subscribe to us on Spotify, Audible, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Don't forget, do not forget to subscribe to us on you- our YouTube channel. Like us, click the notification bell, and make sure you never miss an episode because you do not want to miss an episode. Get over to flagstick.com for even, even more amazing golf content delivered every single day. Well, as always, we appreciate you tuning in. Until next week, I am Jeff Botter. I'm Scott McLeod. Remember, always go for the stick.